Welcome back to C1 Novel and Vocab Week 19. And this is for the novel video. And we'll be going over Because of Win Dixie. In this video, we'll be going over difficult phrases from our novel. And this is to help with cultural fluency by becoming familiarized with different slang and colloquialisms, which means sayings. Students will be able to relate to the novel and incorporate, which means to use, these phrases to convey and show their ideas more precisely. And in this video, we'll be going over our new novel, Because of Win Dixie, the last novel of the semester, and we'll be going over chapters one through five. So let's get started. Please, if you don't have your book already, go get it and turn to page seven with me and I'll be reading and you need to follow along. Let's go to the first indent on page seven. It says, please, said the manager, somebody call the pound. Wait a minute, I hollered. That's my dog, don't call the pound. All the Win Dixie employees turned around and looked at me. And I knew I had done something big. It may be stupid too, but I couldn't help it. I couldn't let that dog go to the pound. Here, what is a pound and why is it called a pound? As you can see in my picture, there are some dogs in cages. So, what is a pound? A pound refers to an animal shelter where stray or lost animals are kept until they are claimed by their owners or maybe they are adopted later by other people. The term pound originated from the practice of impounding or confining stray animals in a designated area until they were reclaimed or they were sent somewhere else. This phrase highlights the manager's concern for the safety and well-being of both the dog and the customers in the store. As you can see, there was a dog inside the Winn-Dixie grocery store, which there should not be. And usually, um, if you find a stray dog, we don't just let it outside and just leave it there. In America, usually they would call the pound or we would also call the animal shelter, another name for it, for the people to take away and to keep there until maybe their owner finds the dog or maybe they're later adopted. So that is why it is called the pound. Let's go to page 12. On page 12, and I'm just gonna read from the top of page 12 so that it's easier for everyone to understand and find. It says, Corners Trailer Park Manager Mr. Alfred called an exception. And I told Win Dixie he had to act like an exception too. Specifically, I told him not to pick any fights with Mr. Alfred's cats or Mrs. Ditweller's little yappy Yorkie dog, Samuel. When Dixie looked at me while I was telling him everything, and I swear he understood. What does it mean here when we say, I swear? The word I swear is a phrase used to emphasize the sincerity or truthfulness of a statement. It's often employed to express certainty or conviction as if the speaker is invoking a higher power to attest to the truth of their words. So this phrase highlights the narrator's belief that the dog's understanding their bond. So here, I swear means like, I'm 100% sure. I really know it. I swear. Usually, we don't really like to say this phrase either. Because when we say I swear, it's kind of like I swear I make a promise, but it's to, not to that person. So it's like, oh, I'm really sure. So instead of saying, I swear, next time, you can always just say, I'm pretty sure, or I'm 100% sure. So here, um, Opal thinks that Win dixie understands everything that she is saying. Let's go to page 19. Page 19, at the very top. Says, I couldn't do anything about his crooked yellow teeth because he got into a sneezing fit every time I started brushing them with my toothbrush and I finally had to give up but for the most part he looked a whole lot better and so I took him into the trailer and showed him to the preacher. What is a sneezing fit? 
A seizing fit here is whenever he was trying to brush the teeth of Win Dixie, he was like, <laughs> so he kept sneezing over and over and over again to have a little fit. Page 19, the same page. Let's go to the middle. And it says, The preacher put down his pencil and rubbed his nose and finally he looked up. Well, he said, smiling real big at Win Dixie. Well now, don't you look handsome? When Dixie smiled back at the preacher, he went over and put his head in the preacher's lap. Don't you look handsome? Here, this is a compliment, and it's delivered in a warm and friendly manner, using a rhetorical device of a rhetorical question to soften it. So it's saying don't in this context is a collo colloquial way, so just saying it. <clears throat> it makes it sound, it makes the compliment sound more conversational and engaging. So it's like, aww, don't you look handsome? Meaning, you do look handsome. So after all of the, the scrubbing and brushing the teeth and everything with the baby shampoo, now when Dixie looked clean. Don't you look handsome? So when you're trying to compliment someone, you can say, aww, don't you look really nice today? Or I can say to someone's handwriting, doesn't that look really good? It's just another way to compliment someone. Let's go to page 21. Page 21. I'm going to read from the beginning. It said, One, said the preacher, we were sitting on the couch and when Dixie was sitting between us, when Dixie had already decided that he liked the couch a lot, one, said the preacher again, when Dixie looked at him kind of hard. Your mama was funny. She could make just about anybody laugh. Two, he said, she had red hair and freckles. Just like me, I said. Just like you, the preacher nodded. Three, she liked to plant things. She had a talent for it. She could stick a tire in the ground and grow a car. But as you were reading, you probably saw that tire was spelled with a Y here. But usually in English, in American English, we use an I. So tire is spelled T-I-R-E. But here we use a T-Y-R-E instead. Uh, the use of tire with a Y instead of an I uh, is reflecting maybe the difference in the language. So here usually it is in British English where they use the Y for tire. But it's just to show a little difference. Just in case if you got confused, no, this word doesn't have another meaning. It just means the regular tire here that you see on a car. And here, I wanted to explain the humor in this sentence. It said that she liked to plant things and that she could stick a tire in the ground so she would put a tire into the soil and all of a sudden she would grow a car, meaning Whatever plant it was, she was just really good at it and she was able to make them all bloom into beautiful flowers or plants. But here, the preacher is just trying to be funny saying that, he, that she would put a tire into the ground and then maybe grow a car. Let's go to page 23. 23. Um, we'll go into the indent here where it says number eight. Number eight, said the preacher with his eyes closed, was that she hated being a preacher's wife. She said she, could, she just couldn't stand having the ladies at church judge what she was wearing and what she was cooking and how she was singing. She said it made her feel like a bug under a microscope. So here, it's saying that the people at the church were constantly looking at Opal's mom, and she, because she was a preacher's wife. So they would look at her and see, oh, what is she wearing? And then they would also see, oh, what is she cooking? Or, and then they would say, oh, hmm, she kind of sings bad. So all these things, everybody was looking at her and all their attention was on her. So it made her feel like a bug under a microscope. Meaning it's being feeling intensely scrutinized or observed in an uncomfortable way. 
This phrase originates from practicing or examining tiny organisms under an actual microscope, as you can see in all my pictures. So it doesn't really mean that people are looking at her through a microscope, but metaphorically and figuratively, meaning every detail is magnified, meaning it's getting bigger and being compared to under a bug under a microscope. So just a feeling of being a bit exposed so that all her flaws or imperfections are being closely examined and highlighted. So she didn't like that part or aspect of being the preacher's wife. So you can say next time if someone makes a little criticism of you, you can be like, oh, stop looking at me like a bug on a microscope. So you're trying to say, please stop trying to criticize me. Page 24. Let's go to page 24. Okay. So let's go to the very last paragraph. It says, I went right back to my room and wrote down all 10 things that the preacher had told me. I wrote them down just the way he had said to me so that I wouldn't forget them. And then I read them out loud to Winn-Dixie until I had them memorized. I wanted to know those 10 things inside and out. That way, if my mama ever came back, I could recognize her and I would be able to grab her and hold on to her tight and not let her get away from me again. So to know something inside out. To know something inside out means to be extremely familiar with it. To have through thorough knowledge of every aspect and every detail about it. The origin of this phrase is not really entirely clear, but it's likely coming from the idea of knowing something so well that you know the inside of it and you know the outside of it. So if you're thinking of our body, you know like all where all the different organs are and outside what my appearance is like. So another way that you can say this is that, oh, she knows that book inside and out, meaning she knows all the details about that book. She knows it from the beginning to the very end. Or you can say, after working with cars for so many years, he knows about engines inside and out, meaning he knows everything about a car engine that you need to know about. So what is something that you know, something inside and out? And page 26. Uh, let's go to the last paragraph on page 26. It says, The other thing about the open arms, the church name, that is different from other churches is there aren't any pews. People bring in their own fold-up chairs and lawn chairs, and so sometimes it looks more like a congregation is watching a parade or sitting at a barbecue instead of being at church. It's kind of a strange church, and I thought Win dixie would fit right in. So if you didn't know what pews were, I wanted to give you a visual. Pews are these little bench chairs that you have at church if you've gone. However, this church, Open Arms, didn't have that. Instead, people would bring their own fold-up chairs like this picture, or even lawn chairs like this picture, to sit at the church. So that's why they were saying instead the congregation looked like they were at a barbecue because usually these chairs are for just leisure and casual, whereas these types of pews are only seen at churches. I just wanted to give you a little visual so that you know. I just found out that there is a mistake here. I spelled churches wrong. Sorry. Oh, and that's it for our video for this week. It's very short this week. Um, and I do have another mission. There are two missions this week. The question is, what animal did Winn-Dixie catch at the church? You just need to write down the animal down on a piece of paper with their name and class. And please don't forget to put it behind the front desk where I have my cylinder of YouTube missions in pink. All right, so now it is time for you to review and self-study. This is for contextual mastery. Please review all the phrases again. Read it out loud. Maybe reread the whole novel where these and see where these phrases came from again to fully understand. And then after that, you should complete your novel homework. Okay? Um, I'll try to make next week's video a bit longer. And until then, bye!
Thank you for joining.